Hello there. I'm Hazel Scott. I'd like you to meet the members of my trio. We have Charlie Mingus on bass and Rudy Nichols on drums. We'd like to do our version of A Foggy Day for you. Hazel Scott is haunting me. At one time, she was the toast of the jazz and popular music world, an internationally renowned pianist and top-selling recording artist. She headlined New York's Cafe Society. She soloed at Carnegie Hall. She was featured in five Hollywood films. She was glamorous, talented, famous, and rich. Her controversial marriage to civil rights activist and U.S. Congressman Adam Clayton Powell was big-time media fodder, dissected and celebrated in the press for years. Three decades before Oprah, she was the first African-American woman to host her own television show. And then Hazel Scott disappeared. From the peak of fame, she slid into oblivion. Whatever happened to Hazel Scott? Why today do we admire and listen to so many of her contemporaries, none of whom were more famous or adored than Scott in her prime? But we never even hear her name. So who is Hazel Scott, and why has she been all but erased from history? Hazel Scott was born on the West Indies island of Trinidad in 1920. Her mother was a classical pianist her father a scholar and intellectual. By the time she was three years old, Hazel was well known around the neighborhood as a piano prodigy. When she was four, Hazel and her mother moved to Harlem. When Hazel was eight, her mother took her to audition at Juilliard. Although the minimum age of admission was 16, one Juilliard professor was so impressed with the little girl's dazzling rendering of a Rachmaninoff prelude that he arranged to have her admitted into Juilliard as his own private pupil. He called her a genius. Then the depression hit. Money was scarce, and Mrs. Scott had to be extra resourceful to find it. All girl bands were big at the time, but clearly none needed a classical pianist. So Mrs. Scott taught herself the saxophone, and she taught herself jazz. For several years, she played with various all-women's bands, eventually forming her own. Mrs. Scott still hoped that her daughter would pursue the classical music career that she herself could not. But teenage Hazel had other ideas. She wanted to play jazz. For a while, she played piano in her mother's own band, honing her chops. While still in high school, Hazel debuted at the hugely popular Roseland Ballroom. Her act followed Count Basie. She was a huge hit. She then hosted her own radio show on WOR in New York City, choosing to play complicated classical numbers, which showcased her piano virtuosity. But it was at Manhattan's Yacht Club working as an intermission pianist where she invented the Hazel Scott sound. To avoid duplicating numbers that others played, she decided to swing the classics. She would take a classical number by Bach or Mozart or Liszt, speed it up, then add syncopation and a strong left hand. Hazel wasn't the first to try this. It's a style often called jazzing up the classics. But to pull it off well, took a mastery of classical music, swing, and the ability to improvise. Hazel had it all. Hazel 
Hazel's career was gathering steam. Then, at age 19, came her big break. It happened at Cafe Society, and it was Billie Holiday who made sure it happened. Southern trees, they're strange. Cafe Society became legendary on its opening night when headliner Billie Holiday debuted her new song, Strange Fruit. Written by Abe Mirapol, this powerful song about lynching became Holiday's signature number. Crowds flocked to Cafe Society to hear her sing it. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. Cafe Society was the first fully integrated nightclub in America. Opened in 1938, Cafe Society was the creation of Barney Josephson, a left-leaning progressive who wanted to challenge the de facto segregation of night spots throughout the country. Even places like Harlem's Cotton Club, which featured black performers, was a whites-only establishment when it came to the clientele. Josephson envisioned Cafe Society as an American version of the European political cabaret, and the club was often the scene of left-wing fundraisers. Featuring the top talent of the day, from Bessie Smith and Miles Davis to Nat King Cole and the Weavers, Cafe Society quickly became New York's hottest night spot. When Holiday had to cut her engagement short, she requested that Josephson replace her with 19-year-old Hazel Scott. He did. Hazel and her jazzed up classics were an instant sensation. In 1940, she recorded her first solo album, Swinging the Classics, which sold well and received rave reviews. Now a shining star at the center of Cafe Society's exhilarating intellectual and cultural scene, Hazel's friends and fans included Duke Ellington, Eleanor Roosevelt, Frank Sinatra, and Paul Robeson. She was making gobs of money. She bought a house in upstate New York and was chauffeured to and from her performances. She had her hands insured by Lloyd's of London. But even as her fame and fortune grew, Hazel Scott always stuck by her political values. She had it written into her contracts that she would not play before a segregated audience. This limited where she could perform, but she didn't care. And if she arrived at a venue only to find that in fact it was racially segregated, she simply walked out. Like Cameron Salt's chocolate and malt, this. When Hazel was 22, she landed a role in a Broadway musical. After seeing the play, New York Times theater critic Brooks Atkinson wrote that Hazel Scott has the most incandescent personality of anyone in the show. It was inevitable that Hollywood would come calling. Ooh. Just hold on and suck in. At the time Hazel Scott showed up in Hollywood, African Americans in movies were nearly always portrayed as buffoons, incompetents, servants, or villains. For African American women, the roles were essentially limited to maids or hookers. Hazel knew all this, and she wasn't going to play along. She had always been committed to projecting an image of pride and dignity while performing. She wasn't going to change that now. Right off the bat, she refused to play any demeaning or subservient roles. She refused to play a maid, mammy, or prostitute. On four different occasions, she turned down the chance to play a singing maid. Hazel had it written into her contract that she would play only one single character in any film she acted in, herself. She also had it written into her film contracts that she had final say over what music she performed and what clothing she wore in each movie. To each demand, Hollywood acquiesced. They wanted Hazel Scott however they could get her. Just a minute. Who do you want to see? I'm Hazel Scott. We're here for the audition. Oh, Miss Scott. Yes, they're waiting for you. Go right in. I'm not much good at promoting, gentlemen, so this audition will have to do the talking for me. But with Lena Horne and Hazel Scott in a new review, 
Why, you've got a surefire hit before you can even reach your checkbook. <laughs> How's the piano, Hazel? I guess it'll hold up. Between her recording successes, concert appearances, and film acting, Hazel was becoming one of the best known and highest paid African American entertainers in the country. Then her career hit a roadblock. She was working on the 1943 May West musical, The Heat's On, for Columbia Pictures. In the movie's final scene, Hazel leads a group of African-American soldiers and their sweethearts in a rousing song and dance number, sending them off to war. Rehearsals went great. That is, until Hazel discovered that the director and costume designer were planning to have the women wear grubby aprons during the scene. Hazel hit the roof. She told the director that no black woman would ever wear a dirty apron when seeing their man off to war. The director told Hazel that how others were costumed was none of her business. So Hazel went on strike. She refused to perform her scene until the women's costumes were changed. After a three-day standoff, the director finally agreed to her demands. The women's aprons were switched to attractive floral print dresses. When Columbia President Harry Cohn got wind of the situation and all the money Hazel's strike cost the studio, he vowed that Hazel Scott would never set foot on another movie studio lot as long as he lived. Other than completing work on a previously contracted film, she didn't. Returning to New York, Hazel resumed her music career. She performed for servicemen at hospitals and at the stage door canteen. She became a pinup favorite among soldiers. And then she fell in love. Is this the land of the free and the home of the brave? Oh. Is this a land with liberty and justice for all? Oh. Is this one nation indivisible under God? No! Either let us practice the democracy we are preaching or shut up. Adam Clayton Powell, Baptist minister, leading civil rights activist in Harlem, first black New York City councilman, and now, in 1945, newly elected congressman of the United States, was 12 years older than Hazel. Powell was already married when he and Hazel fell in love. They began a secret affair, and then, just four days after his divorce, they married. The Scott Powells were the power couple of the moment. Both were accomplished, admired, and respected in their fields. Both were politically progressive and committed to civil rights. Americans, both black and white, were fascinated with this glamorous, controversial, wealthy, attractive pair. Photographers followed them. The press wrote cover stories about them. They were the most famous black couple in America. In 1950, Hazel was approached by the Dumont Television Network to host and star in her own television show. This is the Dumont Television Network. Dumont was the fourth and smallest network in the infant TV industry. With a smaller budget than the big three networks, Dumont learned to do more with less, and they took risks. Dumont produced the pioneering Cavalcade of Stars, a variety show starring Jackie Gleason and his honeymooners. They aired Captain Video and his Video Rangers, a futuristic sci-fi series, and they produced the first television show hosted by an African-American woman. The Hazel Scott Show premiered on April 14, 1950. Unfortunately, no footage of this groundbreaking show exists today. But we do know that the program was a then standard 15 minutes during which Hazel played the piano, sang, and chatted with the television audience. She was the whole show. The show got excellent ratings and was expanded from once a week to three times a week. And then the roof caved in. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the that's basic not principles the of Americanism. Question, that's not the question. Blacklisting in the entertainment industry had been underway since 1947, when the Hollywood Ten, 
a group of progressive writers, directors, and producers were called before the Congressional House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, questioned about their political beliefs, and sent to prison for refusing to answer. In 1950, a right-wing journal put out a booklet called Red Channels. The booklet listed 151 actors, writers, musicians, broadcast journalists, and others in the entertainment industry suspected of being subversives. The list included Orson Welles, Lillian Hellman, Langston Hughes, Leonard Bernstein, and Hazel Scott. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease. During the anti-communist hysteria of the Cold War era, just having your name in red channels was enough to get a person fired from their job and blacklisted from future employment. In an effort to save her career, Hazel volunteered to testify before HUAC on her own behalf. Friends told her not to go, but she went ahead anyway. During her testimony, she denied being a communist or communist sympathizer but she also challenged the morality of HUAC and the entire blacklisting enterprise. In her testimony, she said, It has been possible for all sorts of witch doctors, pseudo-experts, and self-appointed judges to step forward and offer their particular brand of subversive selection. This is the day for the professional gossip, the organized rumor monger, and the smear artist with a spray gun. Her testimony made big news. One week after she appeared before HUAC, the Hazel Scott Show was canceled. And it wasn't just the show. Hazel's career took a sudden plunge. After being in high demand for years, concert bookings were suddenly harder to come by. What's more, her marriage was falling apart. So Hazel went overseas, eventually divorcing Pal and moving with her son to Paris. In Europe, her popularity soared. She gave concerts throughout the continent and around the globe. She recorded new albums. She created a new life for herself. <music> Hazel's Paris apartment became a gathering place for expats and old friends. In 1963, she joined James Baldwin in front of the U.S. Embassy in Paris, protesting racial injustice in America and supporting Martin Luther King's March on Washington. Eventually, Hazel decided to return home. However, when she did resettle in the U.S. in 1967, she found that the music scene had passed her by. Jazz had been eclipsed by rock and roll, and it was becoming increasingly difficult for jazz artists to make a living. Doubly so for Hazel Scott. She didn't do modern jazz. She wasn't cool. Hazel moved to New York to be close to her son and his family. She became a doting grandmother, playing an occasional club date now and then. Hazel Scott died of cancer in 1981. She was just 61 years old. Oh, 